information and I don't like having to do that. Mr. Seacan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is for the CTA and Mr. Streiner. Uh, in your view, why doesn't our air passengers' rights approach deal with physical assault, sexual assault, and assault generally? I assume that your question is with respect to what's proposed in Bill C-49. Yes. Having said that, I think that, uh, as I indicated in my opening remarks, questions around the policy intent and the legislation, I think, are best directed to the Minister of Transport and to Transport Canada. Uh, I would say, however, that I think those sorts of matters um, have the potential to be police or criminal matters. Um, so it may well be that part of the reason was simply that there is another existing mechanism within the law to deal with them. However, uh, the underlying logic, the policy logic of the legislation uh, is, is best uh, a question best directed to the minister. Okay, thank you. Uh, in your opening remarks, you did mention tarmac delays. Uh, how do you see tarmac delays addressed through the proposed uh, amendments? So, um, as you know, the bill proposes that the CTA make regulations with respect to a series of different potential events, one of which is tarmac delays over three hours. Uh, exactly how those will be dealt with in the regulations is something that we'll be able to determine uh, after we've held consultations with industry, with consumer rights associations, and uh, with, uh, with Canadians, with tra the travelling public. That said, I think that the hearings that we held uh, on August the 30th and 31st into the tarmac delay incidents involving two air transit flights underscored the importance of getting this right. Uh, and I think the public reaction to those events and to the hearings themselves indicated that these are issues that Canadians think are very important. And how do you believe, or actually in your opinion, what would be a fair metric to, to determine the CTA's effectiveness in protecting passenger rights? Um, well, I think that the uh, one important metric is the speed with which we are able to process the various complaints. As I noted in my opening remarks, Madam Chair, we've seen a significant increase in the number of complaints, uh, and I think that Canadians uh, expect that when they turn to a body like the CTA, they're going to get relatively quick resolution. So what we've been doing is placing a great deal of emphasis on a process we call facilitation. It's an ombudsman-like process where one of our officers will make some phone calls between both parties, the complainant and the airline, and see if a quick and mutually acceptable resolution can be found. Uh, and uh, we managed to resolve over 90% of complaints, including uh, some of the more difficult complaints through the facilitation process. And I think Canadians will judge us in part on our ability to secure fair but timely resolution of their air travel concerns, and that's something we're going to continue to focus on. Thank you. Um, so I just want to follow up on a question I asked earlier. Do you think specific penalties should be placed in, in the rights? Because penalties aren't specified in there. So at the moment, what the bill indicates is for certain of the events that are listed in the section that deals with the regulations, uh, the Canadian Transportation Agency should establish appropriate levels of compensation. In other cases, it talks more about treatment or appropriate measures. Uh, at the end of the day, obviously, the regulations that we pass are going to follow whatever you and your fellow parliamentarians decide to put in the law. If the law provides for monetary compensation as well as other measures, then we will set the monetary compensation levels through the regulations. If the law doesn't provide for monetary compensation, then obviously uh, we will not be able to include that. And I have a very specific question for uh, Mr. Emerson. In regards to CN, I know there's proposed changes to the percentage an individual shareholder uh, can have, and I just wanted to get perhaps your view on that. Uh, for the benefit of other members, there is a, a, a restriction that is being altered in the, uh, I don't know if it's this legislation or another bill, uh, that limits a single shareholder uh, presently to 15% of the voting shares of CN. Uh, that is being raised to 25%, but the reality is uh, CP is not subject to that. Uh, we have a, a situation where railways in North America are either consolidating or on the verge of consolidating. We've got uh, Berkshire Hathaway owning 100% uh, of, of Burlington uh, Northern uh, uh, railway, and so it makes no sense to me to have an, uh, a limitation placed on CN. 
uh, that, that wouldn't apply uh, to other competitive railways here in Canada. And so I would be an advocate of, of lifting it entirely uh, and putting them on the same footing as, as CP. Uh, Mr. al Katab, did you want to add anything to that? I, I mean, uh, listen, at the, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's not an issue that we, we spend a lot of time on, but, um, you know, the consolidation is real and the competitiveness of our railways are, you know, reliant on their ability to, to raise capital. And I think that, you know, uh, placing one restriction on one railway over uh, all the other players in this, uh, in this market, there is an integration of the North American rail system. So we can't just consider, you know, CP and CN and, and consider that they're not a part of an integrated North American system. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.